did you come to the decision that you were going to stay home with the kids? What was the experience like for you? And what advice do you have for the family that's trying to make that decision right now? Well, for me, it was an easy I thought in that I thought I could be ha- and I made career sacrifices. I was, you know, sort of up and coming in broadcasting in my 20s. And I took a huge hiatus, not knowing if I could ever get back in. I felt in my heart that I could be happy and find happiness at home. And I kind of knew his personality and I felt like he needed to go and find his course in life. And he was fresh out of law school when we got married and he went on to be a public defender and and work in a small law firm with his dad. Then he went to be an assistant DA and then he was a DA and then he went for conference. And so I feel like he needed to do that. I honestly, and I'm not ashamed to say it, I was super happy as an at-home mom. Um, I went back to work because we needed the money ironically, after he after he was elected to Congress, we kind of went into debt with him running for Congress. And so I had to go back to work. And I've been working, you know, on and off part time since. And I, I, I feel blessed to have my job. I love my job. Um, but I will never um, regret those t- those times that I, I stayed home, those years that I stayed home. And there are many days that I wonder if I still should. So, I mean, I know what it go- what goes into it. I felt like I could be happier doing it than he could. I also think I could do better because I could take care of the kids and keep the house clean at the same time. Not something he could do. <laughs> yeah, and, Sh- and Sean, l- listen, for, for me too, like there'd be times I'd be at the job and I'd call to check in on the house to see what's going on. My wife would be, there's chaos going on in the background. And I'm like, yeah, things are tough here too. Like, you know, I'm like, <laughs> and, and we make it sound as if it's such a simple thing. Oh, stay at home, mom. As if like, that's, that's all you do. Like some people say, oh, that's all you do as if that's, that's not enough. And it's, I hate the fact that we look at it. What was, what was your experience like for, for, for you, Sean, being at work, having Rachel home with the kids? We, we lived in a, a smaller town where I was the DA and, you know, she was at home. She's a great cook. But I, was, I had the freedom where I could drop the kids off at school. I could come home for lunch and have lunch with her and then pick the kids up after school and go back to work. It was a really nice life. And, I, and it we, was a nice we life. didn't have as many kids. We had a lot of fun. And so for that point in our life, I think it was really great. And she kept everything together for, for the family. What's doing, everybody? I'm Alec Lace. Thank you for watching First Class Fatherhood. Today's guests on the podcast are First Class Parents, Sean Duffy and Rachel Campos Duffy. These two are from the old school world of reality television. Since meeting through Real World and Road Rules, they have nine children together. You can currently find both of them on Fox News Channel. It's an honor to have them on the podcast today. So get down there, smack the subscribe button, tap that like, and let's jump into it right now with Sean Duffy and his beautiful wife, Rachel Campos Duffy, on First Class Fatherhood. Joining me now, First Class Father, Sean Duffy, along with his wife, Rachel Campos Duffy. Welcome to First Class Fatherhood. It is great to be here. Thank you. Thanks for having us. We're excited to be on the show. All right. Honored to have you here. Let's start it like this. I don't want to take up the whole program, though, with all the names and ages. But if you could, Sean, tell us how many kids do you have? What are the age ranges? Yes. Yeah, so we have, we have nine kids. My oldest is 22 and my youngest is two. So I have a 20-year span. I look good after having nine kids, don't I? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you wear it well. Yeah, we have four. We have four kids. We had three boys that got the girl on our fourth try. Otherwise, we'd be trying to catch up to you guys. But uh, we're, we're solid where we are. <laughs> Still time. <laughs> uh, Rachel, if you could here, just a, a three part here for you right out of the gate. If you could take us back to the beginning of, of your parenting journey, about how old were you when you became a mom? How did that experience change your perspective on life? And what was it like for you to watch Sean become a father? So I was uh, 28 or 29 when I 29 when I had my first child. Um, it was 28. 28. Was I 28? Yeah, <laughs> so long <laughs> ago. And I think uh, I enjoyed it right away. I think what was interesting for me is that I thought I was doing really important work at, at home, and I thought what I was doing was important for the future of our country. But I didn't feel like the world was appreciating what I was doing as an at-home mom because I was an at-home mom for 14 years before I I re-entered the the workforce. Um, And so that's why when I was home, I decided I actually ended up writing a book about at-home motherhood called Stay Home, Stay Happy, because I I really believe that at-home moms do amazing work, but they don't get a lot of credit or a lot of sort of outside attention um, or, or validation, I should say. And so that was something that really bothered me and I wanted to write about it and really edify other women who are making that choice because I think that's what feminism is about. It's about choices. And I didn't feel like the a lot of the women's movements uh, 
thought that what women who chose to go home were making good choices. Um, and so that was something that was important to me. It was incredible for me to see Sean become a father. I think he became the man that he's supposed to be. I think Sean, as a father, is somebody who's uh, very humble, looks at things he's done well, and is readily able to admit when he doesn't do it well and wants to do better. And one of the interesting things about having a big family and kids that span 20 years is we, we made a lot of mistakes with the first batch, and we feel like we got a second chance to do things even better um, with the next. third chance after yeah, that. Um, <laughs> But it's, 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 it's a really good There's point. lots of second chances. You know what? We, we made mistakes. I mean, yeah. I think we're, we're, all of us are new at, at parenthood and fatherhood, and you don't do everything correctly, and you're going to reinvent it and do it better than your own parents. Um, and then we do it oftentimes like our parents, which is, <laughs> which is pretty pretty great, and sometimes it needs some work. But, um, but that was one thing. As I get to my middle-aged kids now, I go, you know what? I might not have done that so well with the older ones. I need to do a better job with this, with these these other kids that like I the have. Like the phone is a good example. I think with the first kids that we had the phone issue with, like when do you give a phone? We we're, now we're, we've we're like, okay, that was way too early. We're, you're not getting a phone until no you're phone. like, yeah. So there's things like that, and we also, Alec, interestingly. We, when our kids age out of our house, and we have now have two that have done that, we do an exit interview and we basically say, okay, what did we do well? What do we need to work on? <laughs> and so that's been interesting too in helping to improve our game. Yeah, well said. Yeah, great to have that feedback loop for sure to be able to mm -hmm. do that with the younger ones. And then, Sean, obviously, um, the last time I had you on a podcast here was January of 2019, uh, before uh, you had to step down uh, in Congress there. We know, obviously, with your daughter born uh, with Down syndrome, with the heart surgery and all that. So my question for you would be, what were some of the challenges for you being a dad to your other kids uh, while being so focused on your daughter with the heart surgery and the whole bit? I think I remember doing that. We were in my office, my congressional office, when I did that that interview. Um, so, you know, for me, first off, I was a lot of members of Congress, whether Republican or Democrat, they don't get a lot of credit. They get beat up quite a bit at home, but they, they work hard. They're gone for four days a week normally. And then when they're back at home, they're doing, you know, parades and fairs and festivals. They're gone a lot. And so it puts some pressure on families. And, and I don't think people like to recognize that because it's such an amazing honor to serve. And it really is. It's, it's so cool. But your whole your whole family sacrifices, and for us, we made the decision that, you know, listen, with this new this new little baby coming with Down syndrome, with the heart condition, just the schedule is too much, and we both need to be there to navigate this time in our life. And it's that's being a dad, being a husband is the most important thing. That's my first job in life, not being a member of Congress, and that's why I stepped down. And just the schedule is too much, and we both need to be there to navigate this time in our life. And it's that's being a dad, being a husband is the most important thing. That's my first job in life, not being a member of Congress. And that's why I stepped down. And when when we went through kind of having the baby, the baby was in the NICU, and then we brought the baby home, all really stressful stuff. And then we, you know, approached the time where we were going to, you know, have to get heart surgery. That was right in the pandemic. As we were about to go down. Right, right, for, right when it hit. Right when it hit, right. We had to go to Chicago for the surgery. And at one point, there's a conversation. Are they going to close the freeway? Can you travel interstate? We were like, this is insane. And our, our baby needs a surgery. But, you know, I think everybody rallies together. And when one, one child needs a little more help than the others, we didn't get a whole lot of pushback or blowback from the other kids. We all kind of have rallied together. And this, this our little Valentina, who's now two, um, you know, was 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 like that for every other every other kid in our family. I was going to say that actually when that happened, our babysitter is it was in her 60s. So at that time, every you know, if you were that age, especially you did not want to you know be near a bunch. At that time, they thought kids might be the the ones trans you know g giving the virus out. So there was a real fear factor. So obviously, we didn't want her at her house. She didn't want to be at our house. So our college daughter flew home and had all of the kids for basically a week while we were at the surgery or five days while we were dealing with the surgery and i mean they were on their own you know Pizza, and yeah it was like cheese. here's a bunch of food make it work and 
we were, I remember calling us calling and, and hearing some of the fighting and what was going on. We were like, we can't deal with this. You guys just have to make it work and work it out. And, you know, a few times we got really angry, but in the end they did rally and they did make it work and they had to, you know, figure it out. And then when we brought this little thing home, she was so fragile, she was tiny and all these tubes coming out and, you know, we were almost afraid to deal with her because she was so fragile and all of us had to deal with her feeding and going to the NICU and all that it entailed. And um, I think it's made our family better. Uh, well, God bless you. And, and very well said. And I can only imagine that'll be a story for them kids as time goes on to always look back and talk about the things they did. And, and Rachel, I, I want to ask you here, listen, right now, uh, it's a scary time in this country for parents. I just had uh, Congressman Jim Jordan on the podcast here to talk about all this. Uh, we see the whistleblower here with the FBI. Uh, parents are being called domestic terrorists. You're letting boys dress up as girls and use the same bathroom as your daughter in school, which is a major problem here. We see the, the critical race theory creeping into the school systems here. So it's kind of a scary, scary time in this country for parents. What's your take on all of it? Um, I think the pandemic had a silver lining. I think a lot of parents woke up during that time. They were seeing what their kids were, were, were studying via Zoom. And they went back when the schools reopened and they wanted to get involved in the school board. And this is what they faced. I, I really commend the parents that have come out and are fighting back. On the other hand, I think the things that you've laid out are so insidious and they are so deep rooted that I'm not sure if as much as we're trying, all of us parents, I'm not sure they're going to change in time to affect you, your child right now, right? The, the changes that are needed, because some of this is Marxism that's happening in the teacher's colleges. How do you root that out from your school board? You really can't do that. You can say, you know, you can pass laws or, or elect people you want, but in the end, what does the teacher teach your child in the classroom when you don't know? And that happens all the time. And so for us, we aren't going to take that chance. And I think a lot of other parents have too. Many people are homeschooling. We found a really great school that's a classical academy that's, you know, rooted in great, great, great books, kind of a, a curriculum. 1950s and, education. Yeah, yeah, essentially. <laughs> we found a place that would reflect our values. And I think that the ultimate solution for all of this isn't at the school board. It's in the legislators. We need to attach the money to the child and we need parental choice and education that's the ultimate answer 100%. wow yeah great stuff and, and sean i read your daughter's i believe avita uh in the federalist she wrote the piece about uh the colleges with the COVID 19 lockdowns now we had these kids going to college paying the full boat the full ticket price and they were doing this at home schooling which doesn't have the same effect and i'm just curious you have all these kids uh, some going through the system now but college seems like a scary place to send your kids they come out hating america you're spending all this money you put them in, in debt uh so what do you what, how do you feel about sending kids to colleges here what's your take on that that is a great question because, again, I learn as I've gone through this process. So one is at the University of Chicago. One went to Madison during COVID for his freshman year. I was like, I'm out. I'm out. Dude, this was horrible. But both of them are still, you know, conservative or libertarian minded. They, they, the universities didn't get them because we did a good job. That was our job to make sure they were rooted and steeped um, in, in their faith and their politics and their beliefs. But I've made the decision now, so that's, I'm two, two are out. I said, I am not going to pay one more dollar to one more liberal school. If you want my participation, I'm gonna help pick where you're gonna go, and I'm gonna go to a good school that gives you a good education. I'm, they're not gonna wokeify you. I'm not gonna lose, I'm not gonna pay to lose you to the radicals at this school. And so I've, I've told all the kids that, but I made, the, I, did, I made a mistake with the first two, but from now on, no more. Yeah, because this is so how many, you get better with more kids. So <laughs> many of these kids are coming back just crazy town, right? Mm -hmm. And parents don't recognize the kids and they paid for it. Mm -hmm. That's got to end. And I think you're seeing new universities and new options popping up all over the country. And that's a real positive because there'll be more options for more parents to have schools that fit their values. And we've had to become better consumers of education. I think about the college tours I took with my first child. Um, and I compare it to the college tour I just took with my third child just a month ago. I, I took her to the University of Dallas. I'm taking her to two more schools um, over the next couple months. I'm asked, I, I think before I was looking at facilities and the, the grounds and is it pretty or you know, were the people <laughs> nice on the tour? I, I want to know what's the curriculum? What are the books that everybody is learning? I, I have become so much better at it. We had on our podcast, 
we had Victor Davis Hansen on and I asked him that question, where would you send your kids? And I think that that's something that, again, we just have to become better consumers of education at the from 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 K through college and especially with college where so many of us are dishing out our life savings why would we pay even if our kids don't end up getting wokeified why would we pay money to these universities to turn out kids who hate our country who learn nothing except basket weaving and and gender studies um no i we're gonna these this is hard-earned money we're gonna put it where it counts yeah, and listen, I, I drive Uber on the weekends here, and there's a college here, a $50,000 a year university, and I'm all, always driving these kids around and listening to them and asking them, hey, what are you studying? And they all want to either be some kind of activist, they want to get involved in, uh, you know, it, it just, none of it makes any sense. And, and they, they never go to class, but they're worried about losing their $20 vape pen if they lose it in a the car. They all yeah. panic, like, you know, <laughs> yeah. but they don't mind skipping out. And, and a lot of these parents, they're still paying off their own college tuitions while right. they're burying their kids in this debt. So the cycle goes on and on. So, uh, De definitely scary there. And I, I do like your philosophy, Sean, on that, uh, of if you're going to be involved in payment for this, you would get to pick the school. I, I think that's brilliant. Yeah. And, and our and kids that, all have skin in the game. Like nobody goes without paying part of their way, because you know. if, if even if I could afford it all, which I can't with nine kids, um, I just think they all need to have some skin in the game. It has to matter to them if it's going to matter to me. Yeah, great stuff. And then I wanted to get a hitter on here, too. They're, 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 they're approving this vaccine for kids 5 to 11, which I, I think is just uh, bizarre that they're doing it and they're allowing kids to have it. I, I think it's your parents' choice to do what you want. But the fact that they would talk about, like I know in California, mandating it for kids 5 to 11, I think is asinine. Uh, so what is your take on this? Would you be vaccinating your kids with this um, uh, you know, experimental vaccine that they have out there? Don't get me started on this question. <laughs> so first of all, not only are they mandating in California and in, in New York and other states, they're tempting kids with offering them $100. And, and Bill de Blasio said, think of how, many, how much candy you could buy with that. I mean, it's just super creepy. So no, there have been no long-term studies. I don't give my kids anything into their body that hasn't had a long-term study on it. And so the answer for me is no. And, and the bottom line is, these kids aren't dying from COVID. Exactly. They're not. Um, and so my issue is, um, why don't why don't we look and say this vaccine helps people who are older or sicker not die from COVID? But everyone who gets the vaccine can still get COVID, can still spread COVID, can still be hospitalized can, from COVID, and can still die from COVID. And so the the thought that if I vaccinate kids, I'm protecting the community at large. Well, I'm not because the vaccine doesn't stop you from getting COVID. It might help you stop you from dying. So I think just how we've been tweaked in regard to the messaging around the vaccine, I agree with Rachel, we should have longer term studies on this uh, on this before we make a decision to vaccinate kids. I, frankly, I don't think we should mandate vaccines on anybody. I think it should be a free choice issue. Look at your health risks, look at your age, and make a decision for yourself. And we and all of our kids have already had COVID. Had COVID. Um, so we have natural immunities and I feel she like- got really sick. I did get sick. I didn't. He took hydroxychloroquine and felt great through it. So, I mean, there's my test. But I'll say that um, I feel like Superwoman. I feel, I feel very healthy. And I think that what's happened in this pandemic that's scary to me and that hasn't been passed on to kids is they have this idea that just getting a jab will protect them. Well, actually, their own health, vitamin D, exercise, eating right, that's probably the best protection for children for, from COVID. And we, we missed an opportunity to get America back on track in terms of health. Um, and, and we went back to like the, the, the big pharma idea that you can cure everything with a, with a jab or a pill. Um, our bodies are amazing machines and we ought to take care of them and teach our kids to take care of them. Yeah, very well said. Yeah, and you mentioned de Blasio there and health. The, the day that I saw de Blasio eating a hamburger at 10 in the morning telling you you can get a free hamburger if you get this, and it's supposed to be about health. I thought it was more of a comedy skit. I can't believe Saturday Night Live wouldn't have jumped all over that, but we know why not. Yeah, but they won't. Uh, yeah, <laughs> and, and I wanted to bring it right back around to you talking about being a stay-at-home mom. My wife stayed home with our kids. We're married 17 years now. She stayed home for the majority of 13 years there with the kids while they were small. I, I think, listen, I think somewhere along the line, our priorities got skewed in this country. 
country. You guys have nine kids today. That's like, wow, they have nine kids back in the day. You know, my, my father was 50 when he had me. They all, my mother was one of eight. My father, one of six. I'm one of seven. Like back then it was no big deal for families to have large families like nine. And they had smaller places to live. Now today people have bigger places to live and they have smaller families. So I wish we would get back to that, uh, where, where, where the family comes into play. And so between the two of you, what, what made the, how was the decision? How did you come to the decision that you were going to stay home with the kids? What was the experience like for you? And what advice do you have for the family that's trying to make that decision right now? Well, for me, it was an easy, I thought in that I thought I could be, and I made career sacrifices. I was, you know, sort of up and coming and broadcasting in my twenties. And I took a huge hiatus, not knowing if I could ever get back in, but I felt in my heart that I could be happy and find happiness at home. And I kind of knew his personality and I felt like he needed to go and find his course in life. And he was fresh out of law school when we got married and he went on to, you know, be a public defender and, and work in a law, law, small law firm with his dad. Then he went to be an assistant DA and then he was a DA and then he went for conference. And so I feel like he needed to do that. I honestly, and I'm not ashamed to say it, I was super happy as an at-home mom. Um, I went back to work because we needed the money. Ironically, after he after he was elected to Congress, we kind of went into debt with him running for Congress. And so I had to go back to work. And I've been working you know, on and off part-time since. And I, I, I feel blessed to have my job. I love my job. Um, but I will never um, regret those, those times that I, I stayed home, those years that I stayed home. And there are many days that I wonder if I still should. So, I mean, I know what, it go what goes into it. I felt like I could be happier doing it than he could. I also think I could do better because I could take care of the kids and keep the house clean at the same time. Not something he could do. <laughs> yeah, and, Sh and Sean, li listen, for, for me too, like there'd be times I'd be at the job and I'd call to check in on the house to see what's going on. My wife would be, there's chaos going on in the background. And I'm like, yeah, things are tough here too. Like, you know, I'm like, <laughs> and, and we make it sound as if it's such a simple thing. Oh, stay at home, mom. As if like, that's, that's all you do. Like some people say, oh, that's all you do as if that's, that's not enough. And it's, I hate the fact that we look at it. What was, what was your experience like for, for, for you, Sean, being at work, having Rachel home with the kids? We, we lived in a, a smaller town where I was the DA and, you know, she was at home. She's a great cook. But I, I had the freedom where I could drop the kids off at school. I could come home for lunch and have lunch with her and then pick the kids up after school and go back to work. It was a really nice life. And I and it we, was a nice we life. didn't have as many kids. Um, had a lot of fun. And so for that point in our life, I think it was really great. And she kept everything together for, um, for the family. And, you know, even now, she's only picked jobs where she's able to navigate her family and her life. And it yeah. works out really well for both of I us. I work on the weekends in the morning while they're sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> hey, listen, that's what it takes too. There's sacrifice there. I'm, I'm a full-time railroad mechanic. I've been doing that for 22 years. I drive Uber on the weekends, do the podcast. I was the super in our apartment building in Bayonne in Jersey there. So, I mean, always been able to pick up something to make it work. And I think most families can find the way to do that. And, and listen, I harp on this show all the time. This is why I love you guys is uh, I talk about the fatherless crisis we have going on in our country. We have so many kids growing up without a father or father figure. It's having a devastating toll on our society. I think if we could just strengthen our family units and bring some God back into our society, I think those two things alone would wipe out 99% of the problems we have in our country. 100%. I think that you've nailed, uh, you, you've hit the nail on the head. It is by far faith and fatherlessness um, or, or the need for more fathers. Those are two things that would solve, I think, 90% of America's problems. I, th that's why I love this podcast. And you know, I, my, my view too is it's great for kids to see their dad work as you know a railroad mechanic and a, and Uber and as a super and just, like I was doing, I was I was I graduated from law school. I'm doing you know law during the week and then I'm doing lumberjack shows on the weekend and I'm making try little, and make little chairs to sell chairs at lumberjacks. So working my 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 tail off to support my family, but hard work and effort is what is it's good for kids to see that. So whether it's in their own jobs when they get older or in school yeah. itself, we work hard at everything we do. And you don't get anything in life unless you work hard and uh, you take risk. Um, and, and a so, lot of kids don't have that role model that you that. are or Sean are and you're right. It's, 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 it's killing our country. And there's something so much more fulfilling about it. It's one thing to work multiple jobs to get a second car or multiple jobs to get a fourth vacation. But it's another thing to do it to provide for your family. It's so much more fulfilling. And I think kids are, uh, or young men are missing out on that aspect of it. And I think it's really crushing our society here. So.
Uh, one thing I want to ask you, listen, obviously being in the, in the spotlight here, Fox News, uh, b- being in uh, politics, it puts the spotlight on you and your family. So how have you guys kind of handled the criticism that's come your way via through social media or stuff like that? Dude, does that get into any problem with your kids, with their friends and stuff like that? Has that taken a toll at all on the family? Well, for us, our, we've been in you know reality TV since we were in our 20s. So I always say my skin's like an armadillo. It really <laughs> just brushes right off of me. You can say anything to me. I read my own mean tweets. It doesn't bother me. But the kids are different. It's it's much harder on the kids. You know, so, yeah. I mean, for us, we are we are we have thick and skin. But mm-hmm. so some some people because of us um, were attacking our little daughter with Down syndrome online, and again, we'd like that, that doesn't affect us. But my kids were like livid and like beside themselves I that people would that say people these would horrible it. things about you know, their new little baby sister, you know, with, with Down syndrome. And you, you can imagine the horrible things they would say. And that was hard for them. And we had to kind of just continue to repeat, they, listen, they don't know you. They don't care about us. Don't read it. Disregard it. Um, but for kids, it's not the same as someone who's kind of gone through it like we have for, yeah. you know, years of our life. Yeah. The social media stuff is is very interesting. And, and I think, uh, very, it just, it's very distorting for young people, especially young girls and young boys, you know, in middle school. And I think um, I just am so glad that I didn't grow up with it. I really am. And I, I, I think it's not good. I, I agree. It's good for certain things. Like I say, promoting something. I don't understand sure. why people are on it if they're not promoting something. But as you mentioned, listen, the first iPhone came out in 2007. And since then, suicide amongst youths has gone up every single year since 2007. It's the second leading cause of death, kids like 7 to 21. So I, I, I don't think it's a coincidence uh, that, that the social media is definitely playing a toll into that. Totally. Absolutely. I, I've had people write me like mad at something I said on TV and said I you know, said horrible things. And then other people commented, um, well, she should, she should, you should kill yourself, you know? And I thought, gosh, you know what? At the time I was probably, you know, 47, 45 when I heard that, but it just imagine being 14 and somebody saying she should kill herself. Look at all these negative comments. You should kill yourself. That's a horrible thing to hear um, when you're young and it can be very isolating and you could feel like I, I remember when it happened, my own teenager saw this thing, this, you know, onslaught. It didn't affect me, but they were horrified that people could write these things about their mom. And they, they said to me, mom, the whole world hates you. I'm like, it's not the whole world. It's <laughs> Holes on, you know, but for those, for teenagers, it feels like the whole world. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, all right. Well, obviously you guys mentioned the podcast there, Sean, what kind of uh, goals or plans do you have for yourself here for the future? Any more political aspirations in the future for you? What's next? Yeah, I don't know. I, um, I love politics. I love, I love the job of representing people and fighting for people and values. Um, but I love being at Fox right now. Uh, it's been fun. I got you know other other interests that I have too. So we'll you know we'll we'll see. I have opportunities. When is the right time to get back in? I don't know. But you know we, the the most important thing was to get our little baby healthy, and she is. And so what the future holds, I do not know. Yeah. How about for you, Rachel? Any more books in the working for you here? What do you got coming up next? Well, I'm glad that Sean has chosen to take time for us, and he's uh, anything that he does. Politically, he's always balancing where it is um, with the family, and I think that's really important. I've got my show of Fox and Friends, um, which I'm, you know, we're, we're we're killing it in the ratings, and we have our new book uh, that just came out. It's actually number one on Amazon right now, and it's called All American Christmas. And it features our Christmas stories, but all the Christmas stories from uh, many, many, many of your favorite talent at Fox News. Um, It's full of heartwarming stories, sad stories, happy stories, funny stories. It's got recipes, playlists, movie lists for Christmas. It's like Christmas explosion. Um, If anyone on your uh, Christmas list um, loves Christmas, and if they're if anyone on their list loves Fox News, this is like the easiest way to get Christmas shopping out of the way because you just order it and it's done and done. And we're really excited that so many of our friends at Fox participated in it. And we're really excited that it's number one because I think, um, you know, Christmas is back. I think our government tried to cancel it and America said, hell no. So <laughs> we're kind of excited about that. 
Great stuff. Yeah, I'm definitely going to drop a link to the book in the description of this podcast episode so my listeners can get over there and check it out. So last thing I want to do, I always ask the dads that I have on here uh, about fatherhood. I'll reshape this question for both of you. We'll start with you, Sean, here. What kind of advice do you have uh, for those new parents or for those about to be parents who are out there listening? That's actually good advice. You know, listen, I think um, I think time matters. You got to give your kids time um, and quality time. Sometimes it's, as they'll say it's, it's quality, not quantity. I do think quantity matters a lot for kids. And I think different points in their, their lives is, is, uh, is more important. So I think those teen years are really important, especially for young boys. I think girls might gravitate towards their mom, but young men need their dads in their lives to, to help them and guide them and uh, give them advice. But don't be hard on yourself. You'll make mistakes. Um, yeah. And uh, don't be afraid to change course when you do make mistakes. And I always rethink. If we think about our jobs, I'm sure you think about your podcast. We think about these things in our life so much. Think about fatherhood. Think about being a parent and what you do well and what you can improve upon. And then make those changes. Well said. Rachel? I think the best thing you can do as a parent is have a great marriage and work on it. And it's not easy, especially the more kids you have. It can be very... It's easier with me. Yeah. (laughs) with your work and and with work and all the demands on life. And and we definitely get into those spaces where we can tell we haven't, you know, invested enough in us, but when we're doing good, the kids are doing much better. And I think that, you know, in the end, they're all going to fly off and then we're just going to be left with us. So we might as well make sure we work on that as for that reason as well. And just the one last point on that, I think that's a good question, but we're always a team. Yeah. Like, there's, they can't divide us. We'll try to get on the same page as we parent, but it's if they and the kids will. This is what kids they, do. They try they, to divide. They, they smell dissension. They like, <laughs> I don't know. We'll be in the, we're on the same page, yeah. same team. They can't divide us. They know that. That's actually that's really important. good advice. Yeah. Yeah, really great stuff. I love the message. This has been an honor for me, Sean and Rachel. You guys are first class parents all the way. And thank you so much for giving me a few minutes of your time here on First Class Father. Uh, thank I, you so our much. Our pleasure. We love your podcast.